May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable and pleasing to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So today is Trinity Sunday. It is the Sunday we celebrate God as three in one. One in three. And Trinity Sunday follows the Sunday Pentecost and the church calendar and gives us the space to ponder the doctrine of what we believe about who God is. It's a fabulous Sunday when us preachers get to spend time trying to explain a difficult subject. We get to spend some time looking at how all of this works. How can God be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all at the same time? How is God both creator and redeemer, as well as sustainer? And how in the world do those things and those parts work together? We had a whole Sunday devoted to how this works. And we might even throw in a bit of history of how the doctrine of the Trinity was put together. However, my friends who are dealing with difficult parenting challenges this week do not care much about the doctrine of the Trinity. For those who are making difficult decisions about the end of life issues for loved ones, and for those who have buried loved ones recently, they could care less about how many parts of God there are. As we deal with this ongoing pandemic and other health challenges in our lives, it's not high on our priority list to understand how the three parts of God work together. And especially this week, as we as a nation confront the issues of racism and oppression and violence, the history of where the name Trinity comes from matters very little. Because in these moments of crisis and challenge and suffering, what matters is knowing that God is present, guiding us through and giving us the strength we need to face these parts of life. When we are confronted with oppression and social events that seem out of our control, what matters is knowing that God is a God of justice who cares for the oppressed and that God's love is the balm that can and will heal. And what matters in these uncertain times when the very fabric of what we know is being torn in two? is knowing the light of Christ that shines in the darkness and knowing the darkness cannot overcome it. From John chapter one, verse five. So in some ways, all of the deep theology, doctrine and history is not as important as just knowing that God is present, working to bring new life, justice and light to the world. Whether God does that as creator or as Jesus or the Holy Spirit. But when the landscape of the world feels like it is crumbling around us, what gets us through it is the ability to go back to the core of what we believe. And the doctrine of the Trinity gives us something to ground and anchor us and then helps us to respond. So on this Trinity Sunday, let's go back to the basics. The idea of the Trinity comes out of our human need to understand who God is, to understand how God works and what God needs of us. God is so vast and seemingly other that it's hard to grasp God as this formless thing. So over time, to help us grasp God, we have understood that there are three parts of who God is, and that all parts of those are God. And in looking through scripture, there are sort of three basic understandings of who God is and the roles that God play. So role one, God is Father, 
which is the traditional language of the Trinity, also called God as creator. Role two is God as son, Jesus Christ, also called the redeemer. And role three is the Holy Spirit as the sustainer. Three parts of God in one being. One being with these three parts, these three different roles, and all are equally God. Let's look at those three different roles. So first is God as Father. The traditional language of the Trinitarian formula is also seen as God the creator. God is the one who created in the beginning, who created each one of us, and is still creating. The first two chapters of the book of Genesis outlines how God created, the ways God did it, and how God did it. And then if you read Psalm 139, it gives us the details of who we are as created by God. In Psalm 139, verses 13 and 14. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. So that's a little bit of the theology part of that first role of God. But as we deal with the challenges of our current world, this part of God reminds us that God created the world and created each one of us. But God did not just create and then step back and say, have fun. You can do that all on your own. God didn't just step back and then watch creation figure it out on its own. God is still creating. God is still actively working to bring wholeness to the world. God is walking alongside us and is even holding our hand, according to Isaiah 41, 13. And God is actively doing a new thing, as stated in Isaiah 43:19. He says, I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So as we face all of this uncertainty, the struggles in our lives and in our country and in the world, the doctrine of the Trinity says there is a part of God that cares about what is happening to all of the things that God created in the world. And not only does God care, but God is actively working to bring newness, wholeness, and a way in the wilderness. I'm about to do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? And this part of the Trinity also reminds us that when we forget that every one of us is created in the image of God and fearfully and wonderfully made, we are given the space to relook at how we treat people and how we confront the sin of racism and oppression as we look at this part of God, the Creator. And as we despair, what is happening in the world, as we are afraid that the end of the world just might be at hand, God steps in, not to just remind us, but to show us that God is actively bringing about new things, new ways of being, and lovingly recreating things that were previously broken. And it gives us hope that God will bring a new way out of the brokenness of the world that we are living in. There's one last piece about this part of the Trinity that we usually call Father or Creator. And this is the part of God that demands justice and is concerned about the well being of all, but especially the poor, downtrodden, oppressed, the widow, and the orphan. And there are many 
many passages where God demands his people seek justice. God calls us repeatedly to bring justice to the world through our behavior and to actively work to bring about the justice that God demands. When Isaiah 1 verse 16, God says, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And then Micah 6, 8 says, he has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? So as we look at who God is and what God calls us to do, we must be seekers of justice. The reality is it is hard to understand what justice is alone to try to figure out what to do about it. And in some ways, justice in the Bible means to make right. Justice is about relationships. It is about our being in right relationship with God, in right relationship with each other, and with creation. Justice is about seeking the good for others and wanting what is best for all people. But right now, we need a guide to show us how to seek justice. Luckily, God knew that we would need some help. So God became incarnate, became one of us in the human figure of Jesus. God becomes human. And this is the part of God that we can see, that we can touch, that we can relate to. And this part of God gives God a chance to see and touch and relate to us. God in Jesus Christ understands what it means to be human. And in that way, we can grasp more tangibly who God is. Because Jesus understood human needs and emotions. Jesus knew hunger and grief and anger. He needed human companions just the way we do. He needed time away. He got grumpy when his followers just didn't get it. He wept and he laughed. And Jesus teaches us what justice means and how to be in right relationship with God and with each other. And that is so important in this current space and time that we are living in. We have a God in human form who not only reminds us that we are not alone, but more than that, teaches us what it means to seek justice. Jesus starts his ministry in Luke chapter 4 by stating very clearly these words from the prophet Isaiah. Jesus says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then Jesus says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. From Luke 4 verses 18 and 19 and 21. So this is what justice looks like, bringing those who are as seen on the margins into the center, saying to them and to those who believe otherwise, you are worthy in the eyes of God. But you know, Jesus isn't done there in just that one paragraph. He teaches that justice looks like loving our neighbor, Luke 10, 27 as well as loving our enemies, Luke 6, 27. Jesus teaches us through figurative pictures of what the kingdom of God looks like and who is included in that kingdom of God and is often not who we think. 
one of those places is in the Beatitudes, in Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12. But Jesus also reminds us that when we're not sure how to get through all of this stuff we're dealing with and are overwhelmed by what it means to seek justice, Jesus says, come to me to rest. And he says, come to me, all you that are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In Matthew 11, which is 28 to 30. But most of all in Jesus, we have demonstrated for us on the cross, the ultimate part of who God is. But God is a God of love. And what love looks like is seen on that cross. Love that is humble and not seeking its own way. It is love freely given to you and to me for the person we don't understand and the person who lives next door. That love freely given to the person of color and for those who are sure they are not racist. This love of God showed in Jesus Christ on that cross is sacrificial love given to every one of us. And then in Jesus' resurrection, we see the power of that love that is so powerful. It beat out death and evil. Death and evil were pretty sure that they had had the last word on that Friday. But it is an Easter morning that we know that love is stronger than evil and death. You know, and when the evil and death of our world became so prominent as it did this week, we have the hope that evil and death do not have the last word. So as we figure out how to bring justice to heal the oppression, racism, and violence of our world, we do so with Jesus walking alongside us, showing us what justice and love looks like and how love will prevail against evil. So now if we only see God as creator, and Jesus as Redeemer is the only true parts of God or the only roles that God plays, we are missing a huge part. And that's the part of God that moves. The part of God that moves like the wind. God is Holy Spirit. And God is Spirit is the part of God that brings help. We hear the story of the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 5, God coming as if like wind and fire, and this part of God allowing us to see and understand one another. We understand the Holy Spirit that clothes with power from on high, and it is what allows God to not be bound by time and space. And the Holy Spirit is what connects us to God and what gives us the power and insight to know what we should do, especially in difficult situations. And the Holy Spirit is now what is helping us to have the courage to stand up for justice. The power and movement of the Holy Spirit is what is moving around us, helping us to speak up, to find a different way of being. A way of being that is just for all people. It is extremely hard to know how to address this institutional racism that has become so ugly in the last week, that has been around for a very long time. It's just hard to know how do you respond. But that is part of the Spirit's job. 
In Romans 8, verse 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness and intercedes for us so that we can hear and know how God would ask us to respond. So there you go. The doctrine of the Trinity. And I'll tell you, there are times when trying to explain the Trinity always seems to be an exercise in futility. Because how do you grasp the various parts of God? And how do you understand how they work together? And the reality is we today didn't even get to the part of how they work together. For today, it seemed less important to understand how it all works together than to know that God comes to us in different ways and different means. But because the nature of God is more than one thing, it means that God is flexible enough and powerful enough to come to us in whatever form we need at that moment. When we need God as creator to remind us that we are all created in the image of God, that part of God is accessible to us. So as God, when we need to know that there is a God of justice who will help us understand how to seek justice. When we need reminded that God understands what it means to be human, we can turn to Jesus. When we need to see how much we are loved, we can see it as God hangs on the cross. And when we need the power and wisdom of God, we have that Holy Spirit blowing in our midst. And that's the power of the doctrine of the Trinity. The traditional language, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. The God who comes to us in the ways that we need so that we can be the people God needs us to be. Amen. Amen.